Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's broadcast. We are going over the LDS Endowment is taught by Joseph Smith. Now, this topic is going to be really fun. And I imagine a lot of people have a lot of thoughts and a lot of knowledge or even preconceived notions as they come to talk about this. And uh, that makes it even more fun. So I'm going to ask that you attempt to just lay aside a little bit of uh, what we all think we know, because what we want to do tonight is try and start from the beginning and move forward uh, through the timeline, through the revelations and the scriptures and the Doctrine and Covenants, other scriptures, and also sources from history of what was going on at the time. It's going to show us a lot about what this endowment in the temple is all about. Now, it's not possible tonight to cover everything, uh, especially everything in church history from, you know, early 1830s all the way until Joseph Smith died in the, through the Nauvoo era. So tonight we'll focus on the Kirtland era, and we'll see that there is enough information there to really get a better uh, grasp on the nature of the endowment, what it's all about. And I think after this presentation, hopefully everybody will have a much clearer understanding and see how it's tied to the gospel of Jesus Christ, how it's tied to the doctrine of Christ. And once we can see those ties, it becomes a lot, a lot clearer. And that's what makes it so fun. Because at the end of the day, all the things need to come back to the doctrine of Christ. Everything's supposed to build upon the rock of Jesus Christ, and that's his gospel, his doctrine. That's what it, so building upon the rock, we're going to see how the endowment was meant to be part of the doctrine of Christ. We're going to showcase that. The scriptures show it. The, the history shows it. It's a lot of fun. And then later in what will have to be a part two, we'll have to go into the little bit later history of Joseph's life in the Nauvoo era, uh, because I know that that is where a lot of the mystique comes in. You know, people come in with with uh, you know all, all the symbols and the rites of whatever of the ceremony that we have now or the different restoration branches and what they have and, and the claims about what happened, it, it does get a little bit murkier. I really love how clear it is with the Kirtland era, and then we will wade into those waters in a part two of the LDS Endowment as taught by Joseph Smith. Uh, so tonight, it will be an important foundation to be able to understand that. Most of the time when we're trying to understand history, we start with all of our uh, preconceived notions, and we try and go back through history from this side of history back through it, and and we subconsciously lay on top of history all of these meanings and things that we understand now that we try and make sense of it. What we want to do tonight is start from the beginning with a blank slate and see what was presented so that as it was presented, we can go, oh, okay, that's what that was meaning. And then later we can approach the other the other things that happened like in the Nauvoo era or, or even in, in the uh, Jackson County era in Missouri. But for tonight, this is a heavy focus on the Kirtland era, and I think uh, it's going to be awesome. Go ahead and tell us in the chat where you're watching from. I'd love to see your name, see where you're watching from. Join in us, join joining us tonight. Okay, let's pull this up. The phrase in the scriptures we're going to see a lot, and in these uh, references, is endowed with power from on high. So let's jump in. First, we're going to look at the scriptures and kind of go chronologically through them, and then we're going to go into other historical references, and we'll be we'll be jumping around in there, pulling the meaning and the information we get as we go, and hopefully that'll help. And I'm sure that there's a hundred different ways we could have organized this. So hopefully this is a way that helps. Uh, I wanted to focus on the scriptures first because the scriptures are a, a, a fantastic and powerful reference to go and understand uh, not only the doctrine, which is what we get out of the scriptures, but also the history. In fact, uh, as I mentioned about building on the rock, understanding the doctrine, I think, is paramount to be, be, being able to connect all the dots properly through uh, through history, especially history related to 
uh, religion, etc., like this. Okay, so coming in here, let's go section 38. Okay, so section 38. This is a revelation given to Joseph Smith. And as we go through these revelations, let's pick out the pieces that are going to help us understand about the endowment. Well, this is in January 1831. So 1831, January, here we go. Starting verse 31, that ye might escape the power of the enemy and be gathered unto me righteous people without spot and blameless. Now I have that bolded and, and underlined because understanding what it means to be righteous and without spot and blameless is going to be thematic. Uh, as we walk through these scriptures and these pieces of history. So keep that in mind. Wherefore, for this cause, I gave unto you, I gave unto you the commandment that you should go to the Ohio. And there I will give unto you my law. And there you shall be endowed, endowed with power from on high. So there it is. The first reference in the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, the first reference to the phrase being endowed with power from on high, where at, at the Ohio, when the Lord commands him, of course, to build the Kirtland Temple. I'm skipping down to 38. See that all things are preserved, and when men are endowed with power from on high and sent forth, all these things shall be gathered unto the bosom of the church. This idea of being sent forth, we're going to see that. We're going to see a connection between what happened in Kirtland and with the apostles in Jerusalem before they were sent forth, because the Lord told them to wait. And we're going to see that. We're going to see a parallel, an important parallel between those apostles in, in uh, Christ's day in Jerusalem, waiting for this endowment, and then being sent forth to preach, and the same thing, that same patterns repeated here, okay? Let's go to the next one. Okay, so now, just a few days later, we get section 39, so that's the very next section. This is just a few days later. So, starting in verse 15, inasmuch as my people shall assemble themselves at the Ohio, I have kept in store a blessing such as is not known among the children of men. Now, this blessing is a very specific blessing, and we're going to find it out. And it shall be poured forth upon their heads, and from thence men shall go forth into all nations. There it is again, sending them forth to preach, just like the apostles of old. But verily, verily, I say unto you that the people in Ohio call upon me in much faith. I love this. Thinking I may stay my hand in judgment upon the nations, but I cannot deny my word. By the way, quick side note, just because this phrase is here and, you know, talking about the last days and, and the judgments of the Lord, it is a popular thing today for people to pray and beg God to stay his hand of destruction and thinking that we can somehow bypass the destruction by by asking God in much faith that, that he'll stay his hand. But look, it was already addressed. That already happened. It happened way back then. And he said, sorry, it's, it's going to happen. The judgments are coming forth. I can't deny my word. Wherefore, lay to with your might and call faithful laborers into my vineyard that it may be pruned for the last time. Just a fun side note. Okay. Uh, and continuing. So continuing, and inasmuch as they do repent and receive the fullness of my gospel and become sanctified. Now that's bolded. I will stay my hand in judgment, at least my hand in judgment upon them. Wherefore, go forth, crying with a loud voice, saying, The kingdom of God is at hand, crying, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Most High God. Go forth, baptizing with water, preparing the way before my face for the time of my coming. Now, this right up there in verse 18, where it's bolded, receiving the fullness of my gospel and becoming sanctified. That is really important. That is really important. And let's move on here. And for the, for the time is at hand, he continues. The day or the hour no man knows, but it surely shall come. And he that received these things receives me, and they shall be gathered unto me in time and eternity. eternity. Now look here, and again, it shall come to pass that on as many as ye shall baptize with water, ye shall lay your hands, and they shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and shall be looking forth for the signs of my coming, and shall know me. Now that's bolded and underlined because that theme is going to permeate all of this tonight, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. So now, uh, next month in February, we get another revelation, it's known as section 43. So here it is again, ye are to be taught from on high, sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be endowed with power that ye may give, even as I have spoken. Now, again, we see the word sanctification, sanctify, that is tied intrinsically to the endowment of power. And we have to remember that as we're trying to put these pieces together.
okay, same month. Same month, uh, later in the month, later month of February, we don't have an exact date. Section 44. So this revelation, Behold, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servants, it is expedient in me that the elders of my church should be called together. So there's this assembling together in the land of Ohio, and it's going to be at the Crowland Temple, and it's going to be a solemn assembly. We're going to see that here. From the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, by letter or some other way, and it shall come to pass that inasmuch as they are faithful and exercise faith in me, that's important because this is the piece that we're trying to put together. I will pour out my spirit upon them in the day that they assemble themselves together, the day of the solemn assembly. Okay, And it shall come to pass that they shall go forth into the regions round about and preach repentance unto the people. There it is again going forth after. Now he doesn't say endowment of power here. Notice he doesn't say endowment of power. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon them. That is super helpful. Okay, now let's fast forward. So this is end of December, 1832, Revelation, section 88, powerhouse revelation. Here is the phrase. Look at here, starting in verse 70. Tarry ye, tarry ye in this place, Carlin, and call a solemn assembly, even of those who are the first laborers in this last kingdom. Skip down to 74, and I give unto you, who are the first laborers in this last kingdom, a commandment that you assemble yourselves together, and organize yourselves, and prepare yourselves. And here it is, and sanctify yourselves, yea, purify your hearts, there it is, and cleanse your hands and your feet before me, that I may make you clean. That I may make you clean. Okay, that I, I make you clean, that's the part, that's the endowment of power, that's the pouring out of spirit upon them, Okay. that I may make you clean, that I may testify unto your Father and your God and my God that you are clean from the blood of this wicked generation. And here it is, that I may fulfill this promise, this great and last promise, which I have made unto you when I will. Now, the great and last promise, we're going to look at this promise because this is a very specific promise. In fact, it's the part of the two-way promise, which is the covenant with us and God, the covenant, the everlasting covenant. Okay, now let's uh, skip. Now this is skipping forward six months, mid-1833. Joseph Smith Revelation here, section 95, verse 8. Yea, verily I say unto you, I gave unto you a commandment that you should build a house in the which house I design to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. And then here it is again. For this is the promise of the Father unto you. Therefore I command you to tarry even as mine apostles at Jerusalem. There, there it is. There's the introduction even as mine apostles at Jerusalem. So the, the commandment to tarry to receive this endowment of power from on high. All right. And, and connecting that to the promise of the Father. Okay, so let's jump over then to the New Testament in Luke where he said this. So behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you to the apostles. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. Or undued, same thing. Old English. We don't use it anymore. Until you be endowed with power from on high. So the apostles had to tarry in Jerusalem for this to take place. So if we come back here then, he clarifies, we saw it in 88. Tarry ye, tarry ye, call a solemn assembly. Sanctify yourselves, be prepared, cleanse yourselves, cleanse your hands, your feet, that I may make you, that I may make you clean. So we can wash ourselves all we want. And we can do all this stuff, and we can even do baptisms. But uh, as Joseph said, you know, doing baptism by water without the getting of the Holy Ghost isn't going to mean anything. You can do it a hundred times. doesn't matter. So that's the part that we're going to look at, that I may make you clean. The power of Jesus or the baptism of Jesus Christ. All right. So let's come back to here. So. I design to endow them with power from on high, and this is the promise. So tarry or wait, even as mine apostles at Jerusalem, before you go out to all the world. And then here it is. So we'll be coming and taking a look at this event, um, which of course is the day of Pentecost, right? Let's go to the next one. So now looking at section 105, which is... Uh, Next year, so now we're a year later, mid-1834, Joseph Smith Revelation here, 
starting in verse 9, Therefore, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it's expedient to me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. Now, quick side note, this redemption of Zion, Zion fell. Okay, so Zion began to be established in Jackson County. Zion falls, the Lord calls them to redeem it. But then we have this little stay here saying, well, got to wait. Got to wait. Wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion, that they themselves may be prepared. And that my people may be taught more perfectly, have experienced no more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. So here it is. And this cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I have prepared a great endowment and blessing to be poured out upon them inasmuch as they are faithful and continue in humility before me. Now that being faithful and continuing in humility, this is the new and everlasting covenant that we're going to be looking at. So. Continuing down to verse 17. But the strength of mine house have not hearkened unto my words. The strength of mine house. This is referring to the parable of the redemption of Zion found in section 101. Just a few sections prior, uh, several months prior, uh, Joseph received revelation about Zion falling. And then the Lord gave him a parable teaching how the redemption of Zion. Well, first of all, teaching how Zion would fall, and then teaching how it would be redeemed. Now, that's extremely important, especially for the final days leading up to the second coming, leading up for Zion to be redeemed, uh, because, of course, New Jerusalem hasn't been established yet. Uh, that's going to be part of the redemption of Zion. So, these are little hints. We don't have time to go into that, uh, but we do have we do have some episodes on that, so we can definitely, you can definitely go find some more of those. But let's continue here. But the strength of mine house taken right from the parable, they haven't hearkened to my words. But inasmuch as there are those who have hearkened unto my words, now hearkening to the Lord, that has to do with this new and everlasting covenant, I have prepared a blessing and an endowment for them if they continue faithful. I have heard their prayers and will accept their offering for a sacrifice of a broken heart, country spirit. That offering, so that comes right out of uh, Third Nephi 9 verse 20, which we're going to go to next. And it is expedient in me that they should be brought thus far for a trial of their faith. Okay, so let's let's check this out really quick. Let's go to 3 Nephi 9, verse 20. Just to mark that a little bit. The words of Jesus Christ to the Nephites in the darkness. He says, ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Even as the Lamanites, because their faith in me at the time of their conversion, were baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. So being baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, this is what it's all about. This is what the Lord's pointing to, pouring out my spirit upon you, like, like we read earlier. Okay, that pouring out his spirit upon us, the being baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost. This is the important element that we're looking at. This is the endowment of power we're going to see, which, let's see, let's come back to the slide, which we're going to keep seeing. So here, skipping down to verse 33, still in section 105, verily I say unto you, it is expedient in me that the first elders of my church, as mentioned, we read earlier in 88, first labors of the last kingdom, they should receive their endowment from on high in my house, which I have commanded to be built unto my name in the land of Kirtland. And let those commandments which I have given concerning Zion and her law be executed and fulfilled after her redemption. After her redemption, interestingly, which still hasn't happened yet. There has been a day of calling, but the time has come for a day of choosing, and let those be chosen that are worthy. Now, what is this talking about? Well, Let's keep going. And it shall be manifest unto my servant by the voice of the Spirit, those that are chosen, and they shall be sanctified. And inasmuch as they follow the counsel which they receive, this again referring to the new and everlasting covenant, because we have to obey the voice of God, that is the promise that we give. They shall have power after many days to accomplish all things pertaining to Zion. So we have the voice of the Spirit. This is important because it is done by God's will, we're going to see. And this idea of being chosen, the idea of being chosen has to do with, uh, 
is the same as election, chosen and election, the same idea, being chosen, being elected. Those are synonymous. So calling an election, uh, calling and choosing. So we have the day of calling and then choosing. So the Spirit calls us, and then if we obey the Spirit, then we can be chosen. If we obey the Lord. Okay? Accomplish all things pertaining to Zion. Uh, let's skip to section 108. Now this, section 108, is revelation for uh, one of the elders, uh, Brother Sherman. And here we see some of these pieces, which is really awesome. Arise up and be more careful henceforth in observing your vows. What vows? The vow of the covenant of offering up a broken heart contrary spirit, saying, I will do your will. I, I vow to do it. I vow to obey you. But then look at this. Uh, wait patiently until the psalm assembly shall be called of my servants, then you shall be remembered with the first of mine elders, which we just read about, being endowed with power from on high, and received by right by ordination with the rest of mine elders, whom I have chosen. There it is again. Behold, this is, here it is, the promise of the Father unto you if you continue faithful. So we'll be looking at what this promise is. If you continue faithful, obeying the Lord's voice. In fact, I missed verse two where he said, hey, you were, you, were, you were blessed and your sins are forgiving you for obeying my voice when I told you to come hither to ask Joseph. So the Lord prompted him by the spirit to come and ask Joseph for a revelation concerning his duty. So he came and uh, this is, this was the result. And now we have it as section 108. Now, I know I'm burning through these scriptures. We're going to walk a little bit more methodically after we go through these revelations, and then we're going to start go, turning through the sources of history and looking at some other scriptures and getting these more tightly knit together as we see how they really connect. But we have this promise of the Father again. So here, so here we're going to uh, the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple, which is now in end of March 1836. So this is section 109. This is all the prayer which was given to Joseph by revelation by the Spirit of what he's, he's uh, supposed to was supposed to say in the in this dedicatory prayer. Okay, we're not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to just point out the highlights that are going to help us unravel this this mystery. Thanks be thanks be to thy name, O Lord God of Israel, starting right here in verse one, who keepest covenant. And showest mercy unto thy servants who walk uprightly before thee with all their hearts. That is the new and everlasting covenant right there. And God will keep his covenant, which is his promise. Again, promise. We keep seeing this popping up. See right here, end of verse 5, right there at the bottom, promise of the Father. Well, the covenant is just the two-way promise. So our promise, again, right here, 3 Nephi, verse 20, to offer as a sacrifice a broken heart and contrite spirit, promise to obey his word, do his will in all things. Okay? So, right here in the dedicatory prayer, he starts off with that. Because this covenant, the everlasting covenant, is if you will offer a sacrifice of a broken heart and contrite spirit, I will baptize you with fire and the Holy Ghost. Okay, so... For thou knowest, skip down to verse 5, that we have done this work through great tribulation, and out of our poverty we've given of our substance to build a house to thy name, that the Son of Man might have a place to manifest himself to his people. Now, there are, in Scripture, two grand ways that the Lord will manifest himself to his people, in power through the baptism of fire the Holy Ghost, through the giving of the Holy Ghost, which witnesses unto the Father. We're going to read that here shortly. And then, two, uh, through... The, a literal appearance through the second comforter being taken to his presence in the fullness of his glory. So here, we see that connection through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That the Son might have a place to manifest himself to his people. Skip down to verse 10. And now, Holy Father, we seek thee to assist us, thy people, in thy grace, calling our solemn assembly that it may be done to thine honor, to thine divine acceptance, and in a manner that we may be found worthy. So being found worthy, being clean, this is central to it. In thy sight, to secure fulfillment of the promises which thou hast made unto us, thy people, in the revelations given unto us. Those are those are the revelations we just read. Those revelations where the Lord promised to endow them with power from on high if they continued faithful, if they did what he said to do. And doing what he said to do after we promise and covenant to do it, that's fulfilling the offering of a sacrifice of a broken heart and contrite spirit so that he can endow them with power from on high or pour out a spirit upon them or baptize them with fire and the Holy Ghost. 
and that they may grow up in thee and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. See, there it is. That they may grow up in thee and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost or receive the gift of the Holy Ghost or be baptized with fire in the Holy Ghost. Same thing, all synonymous. And be organized according to thy laws and be prepared to obtain every needful thing. Okay. So, and by the way, as I'm saying these things that are synonymous and whatnot, it is, um, it would be helpful if you, you could reference this presentation I did before on what is the baptism of finding the Holy Ghost. That will go a lot more in depth. We will be touching a little bit more tonight because it's central to tying into this, but this, that's, uh, that's a much more in-depth presentation to, to help tie this stuff in. However, we will be going over the basics tonight. Let's go on, skip down to verse 22 in this dedicatory prayer. And we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, the, a specific power, the power of the Holy Ghost, and that thy name may be upon them. There it is. And thy glory be round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. Thy name be upon them. Well, when do we receive the name of Christ? That's what we have to understand more thoroughly. And if we jump to the Book of Mormon, we get a very clear uh, indication. So let's jump to the Book of Mosiah for a quick second. So we we get this in context. And this is Mosiah chapter 5. And we'll start in verse 5. And we'll just kind of look at th these references here now. The people have just gone through receiving, receiving a remission of their sins. In fact, if we just glance really quick at verse 4 when they have this experience. So Mosiah chapter 4, they fall down to their knees after this great sermon by King Benjamin. And they cry out, oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins, that our hearts may be, there it is, purified, for we believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, now skip down. And it came to pass that after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were filled with joy, having received remission of their sins, because of the exceeding faith that sat in Jesus Christ. So, here as they start receiving the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, now he continues talking to them, and then verse 5, they cry out with one voice, saying, We believe all the words which you have spoken, and we know their truth, because the Spirit of the Lord, which has wrought a mighty change in us, there's that mighty change, or in our hearts, no more disposition to do evil, do good continually. And then skip down, they keep going. And we are willing to enter into a covenant with our God to do his will and, and be obedient to his commandments in all things that he shall command us all the remainder of our days. Obeying the word of the Lord and directing them all the rest of their lives. It is, it is what we call carte blanche, signing the bottom line, saying, Lord, you can give me the terms and conditions the rest of my life. I'm signing it. And you can just direct me. So. Let's go on. And then these are the words what King Benjamin desired. And so he says to them, you've spoken the words that I desired. And the covenant that you have made is a righteous covenant. We were looking at that being able to be righteous. Here it is. Because of the covenant which you have made, here it is. Because of this covenant, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters, for behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For you say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, you're born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. This is when we receive the name of Christ. And under this head, you're made free. And there's no other head whereby you can be made free. There is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. Therefore, I would that you should take upon you the name of Christ. There it is. Take upon you the name of Christ, become his sons and his daughters. All you that have entered into the covenant with God, that you should be obedient unto the end of your lives. All right, and then verse nine come to pass that whosoever doeth this shall be found at the right hand of God, for he shall know the name by which he is called, for he shall be called by the name of Christ. Oh, I love it, love it. And if we just jump back to 35 9, so this offering up sacrifice, broken heart, contrary spirit that is the same thing. That is the covenant of promising to do his will, keep his commandments in all things the rest of my life. Carte blanche, there it is, Lord. You give me the terms and conditions, I will do it. Well, if we just scroll up just a little bit. This was preceded by this statement. As many as have received me, received my gospel, same thing, to them have I given to become the sons of God. Or the adopted, spiritually begotten sons of Christ, sons or daughters. And even so I will to as many as shall believe on my name. For behold, by me redemption cometh. This is how we are redeemed. Okay? And that's down here. Become sanctified like this. 
and, th and then he and he sums it up here. Behold, I've come unto the world to bring redemption to the world to save the world from sin. And that is done right here. Sacrifice of a broken heart, contrite spirit. All right? So we see this theme of being cleansed, being sanctified, being purified through receiving the Holy Ghost or through the baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost and receiving the name of Christ, which right here in verse 22, that thy name may be upon them, that it might be. So it's conditional. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. Even though these guys have been baptized by water. These were all, all these elders of the church have been baptized by water. They'd already, they'd already done this covenant with their words, with their mouths, and yet it hadn't happened yet. Hadn't happened yet. Because you have to prove it through faith. We saw this through their faithfulness. Got to prove it. Always have to prove it. Um, because with our lips, we can honor God, and that's good. And we have to honor him with our lips, but it has to also be matched by our hearts. And that takes more time. It doesn't necessarily happen in a day. We have to prove that we will do his word and follow his will. Just like those people in King Benjamin, they'd already been baptized. They were righteous people, but they hadn't yet finished that process. And that was the end of their process of proving to God they'd be faithful to him. And so they received that great remission of their sins in uh, Mosiah chapter 4 and 5. So if we uh, skip to 3 Nephi, we'll see one more reference that helps us tie this together. In verse 20. So 27, 20. Let's see, let's change the screen again. Instead of 9, verse 20, this is 27, verse 20. And it's the same topic, interestingly. Now, this is the commandment Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. This is how we stand spotless, being baptized with, with fire and the Holy Ghost. Now, that standing spotless was mentioned by King Benjamin, the famous the famous verse in Mosiah 3, uh, 19, right? The, about the natural man. Let's just read it real quick. And I'm sure it's uh, probably memorized by half the crowd here, but 3, 19. Well, let's see these words, and let's take them into context for what we're looking at. For the natural man is an enemy to God, and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and puts off the natural man, and becomes a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. A saint, holy, without spot. Becomes as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him. That's, that's signing the carte blanche. That's being willing to enter into this covenant to do anything the Lord tells us to do the rest of our lives, even as a child submits to his father. And we see, and we see this throughout all these scriptures here, which brings us back to the prayer here at the current temple. We can obviously go on and, and go deeper and deeper because this is the gospel. This is the doctrine of Christ. So we could go on forever, but hopefully we've made the point enough that we can Continue here in the dedicatory prayer. So we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, a specific power, the power of the Holy Ghost, having received it, and that thy name may be upon them, which happens at the reception of the Holy Ghost, and thy glory be round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. Okay, let's continue. Skip down to 35. Let the anointing of thy ministers be sealed upon them with power from on high. There it is. Let the anointing of thy ministers be sealed upon them with power from on high. Hmm. Let it be fulfilled upon them as upon those on the day of Pentecost. There it is again. There's this idea of the Pentecost being fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. So we are going to dive into what happened at Pentecost. And we're going to see that it comes right back around to this idea of baptism from the Holy Ghost. So this is this endowment that's supposed to happen here. Let it be fulfilled upon them as upon those on the day of Pentecost. Let the gift of tongues be poured out upon thy people, even cloven tongues as of fire and the interpretation thereof. Now we're going to look at what this cloven tongues as of fire is. We look um, 
in Acts chapter 2. And let thy house be filled as with a rushing mighty wind and with thy glory, which is the power of his spirit. Put upon thy servants, verse 38, the testimony of the covenant. What? That's a that's a pretty poetic phase, phrase. But what does it mean? To put upon thy servants the testimony of the covenant. Well, let's we have to jump to um, Nephi 31, where he explains the doctrine of Christ. The testimony or the witness of the covenant of the Father or the promise of the Father. So let's see here. Verse. 2 Nephi 31, verse 18. Let's read this. Let's skip over right here. Okay. So I'll ask, mid middle of 17, for the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the remission of your sins. Here's how the remission comes, by fire and the Holy Ghost, which is how we know that with the people of King Benjamin, when they received, received the great remission of sins, it was through baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, and then after that moment are ye in this straight and narrow path, which leads to eternal life. So here it is. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate, done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son, so you've proven that you will do what he says, and you've received the Holy Ghost through the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And here it is. Which witnesses or testifies of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made that if you entered in by the way, you should receive. So if you enter in by this way, on this path of doing my will and being baptized with water, repenting of all your sins, then you will receive the Holy Ghost through the baptism of fire the Holy Ghost right here. And that testifies of the Father to fulfill his promise, which is that covenant. Well, that helps us understand this right here. In verse 38. Put upon thy servants the testimony or the witness of the covenant or the promise of the Father, that when they go out and proclaim thy word, they may seal up the law, prepare the hearts of thy saints for all those judgments that are that uh, thou art about to send in thy wrath upon the heavens of the earth. Let's uh, okay, let's skip down to verse 44. But thy word must be fulfilled. Help thy servants to say, with thy grace assisting them. Here it is. Thy will be done, O Lord, and not ours. That is the new and everlasting covenant. That is the essence of this two-way promise. Choose God through doing what he wants, and then he'll choose us by making us his sons and his daughters, Christ's sons and his daughters, to be spiritually begotten. So so, so that those are very powerful references in the dedicatory prayer. Now we have just a couple others here in the Revelations, and then we're going to dive in a little bit more into some of these historical references and, and other scriptures to tie them and tie them together. So the next section, 110, this is Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, their visions. Shortly after uh, the dedication, this was April 3rd, so we're talking uh, one week later. V verse 7, for behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest to my people in mercy in this house. So the Lord manifesting himself to us, manifesting himself to us is through the baptism of the Holy Ghost to, to give us that witness of the Father and the Son, as we just read in, in 2 Nephi 31. Yea, I will appear unto my servants and speak unto them with mine own voice. If my people will keep my commandments, my sayings, and do not pollute this holy house. Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out. And here it is. And the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. So the true and faithful servants did actually receive it. The Lord is confirming here. Interesting. So. When we're talking about the power of God, so he's talking about endowing them with power from on high. Let's just read this brief uh, segment here from section 84. Now, this was back in 1832, Revelation to Joseph Smith. So the greater priesthood administers the gospel and holds the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God, verse 19. Therefore, in the ordinances of the gospel, the power of godliness is manifest. Which ordinances? Baptism of water, fire, and the Holy Ghost. That's where this power of God, the power from on high being manifest. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this power of godliness, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. God. Now, sought diligently sought diligently to sanctify the people 
So the sanctification, we just read how that sanctification comes. It comes through the reception of the Holy Ghost, which we saw right here in 3 Nephi 27, 20. Okay. Be baptized in my name that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost to stand spotless before me the last day. So if you want to stand spotless before God and be able to, this is right here, behold the face of God in the flesh, we have to have the sanctification, which is receive this power from on high, this power of godliness, the power from God, that power through the reception of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost. So, jumping into church history, now we're going to kind of walk through uh, what else was going on. So those were the revelations. We have all this other awesome stuff to help put these pieces together, understand more clearly, just in case like, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's what, uh, I don't know if that's what this is talking about. Let's dive through more and start putting some of this together. So here is going into section 79, this revelation. Uh, let's look at this. So this is to Jared Carter. Verily I say unto you, it's my will that my servant Jared should go again to the eastern countries in the power of the ordinance where he has been ordained, proclaiming glad tidings, great joy, even the everlasting gospel. And I will send upon him the Holy Ghost or the Comforter, which shall teach him the truth and his way whither he shall go. Okay, so the Comforter or sending upon him the Holy Ghost, this idea, he was one of these elders that was given this promise. We're going to see a bunch more as we go forward. Okay, so this footnote, this is the footnote from uh, the uh, Joseph Smith papers when you're looking at the revelation there. So in his journal, Gerald Carter wrote that the power of the ordinance where he'd been ordained was the high privilege of administering in the name of Jesus Christ to seal on earth, build up the Church of Christ, and work miracles in his name. Joseph Smith stated earlier that the order of the high priesthood is that they have power to seal saints up to eternal life. This similar terminology, as well as Carter's reference to the high privilege, suggests that the ordinance wherewith he has been ordained refers to his ordination to the high priesthood uh, in 1831. Through the, though the day of this ordination is unknown, his journal provides some hints. Um, and this, you'll find, I'm mentioning this because it talks about being endowed with power from on high, and that was a slightly different reference uh, than we're going to read here. So as you dive through, you are going to see an occasional reference to a power being associated with the priesthood, being endowed with power from on high. You are going to run into that a little bit. And I'm mentioning that now so that so that you know that you have to just watch and see the difference because if it's referring to receiving the priesthood, the power of the priesthood, that's not the same as was promised uh, in the endowment of power from on high at the Psalm Assembly with the Kirtland Temple. It's important to understand and be able to differentiate that. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so oh, let's, we'll just skip that note. Okay, so right here, so we have minutes from the High Council in Kirtland. This is in April 1834. Brother Sidney took up the second item of discussion, namely the endowment of the elders with power from on high. He gave an account of the endowment of the ancient apostles. So again, a reference to the ancient apostles when they were endowed. The Lord said, tear you Jerusalem to be endowed with power from on high, which is the promise of the Father. And laid before the conference the dimensions of the house to be built and rehearsed the promise to the elders in the last days, which they were to realize after the house of the Lord was built. There it is again about the promise. Uh, here in minutes again from the High Council in February, same year, the work of the building the house of the Lord in Kirtland was also taken into consideration. It was decided that the brethren in this place should assist in erecting the house, all that is in their power that the elders of the church may be endowed with power from on high according to the promise of God, that the work of the Father may roll forth. So we keep seeing this promise of the Lord. We've read it a bunch already. So let's, again, we, we just read in 2 Nephi 31, fulfilling the promise which he hath made, that if you did enter in by the way that he told you, you would receive the Holy Ghost, the baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost. That's the promise. And we see it again in Moroni 10 in slightly different verbiage. And again, if by the grace of God you're perfect in Christ and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant or the promise of the Father unto the remission of your sins that you become holy without spot. There it is again, the remission of your sins, becoming holy or becoming a saint without spot, which is what we just saw, of course, in 3 Nephi 27, where 
we'll keep seeing everywhere else. There it is. Reception sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost that you may stand spotless before me at the last day. And here, right here, we saw in section 95, again, just to review because we just read it, I designed to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high, for this is the promise of the Father unto you. Therefore, I command you to tarry, even as mine apostles at Jerusalem, to tarry for that same endowment of power from on high. And we see that again. Luke 24, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until you're endowed with power from on high. Okay, let's look at this. This is a letter to Lyman White and other elders um, in August, same year, 1834. You will recollect that the first elders are to receive their endowment in Kirtland before the redemption of Zion, which we read in, in the Revelation, which is section 105, before Zion can be redeemed. You will recollect that your high council will have power to say, who of the first elders among the children of Zion are counted worthy? This is this is really important. We're going to see uh, here in the minutes who, who these elders were, or at least a number of them from that meeting. And you'll also recollect that you have my testimony on behalf of certain ones previously to my departure. Now, we read earlier that the Lord would give by the voice of the Spirit through Joseph Smith, which elders are chosen. That was That was what we read. So here is the pieces of history that go along with that. And here, here is the minutes, 23rd of June, 1834, talking about it. So a council of high priests met according to the revelation in order to choose some of the first elders to receive their endowments, being appointed by the voice of the Spirit uh, through Brother Joseph Smith Jr., president of the Church of Christ. Proceeded first. And you look at it over and over again. Edward Partridge, called and chosen, received his endowment with power from on high. W. Phelps, called and chosen. Called and chosen. See that? Called and chosen. So the Lord said, we read in the Revelations, that a day of choosing is coming. So, so if you have desires to serve God, you're called to the work. Right? Well, choosing happens next. So you can be called to the work just with your heart, you know, say, Lord, I want to serve you. Boom, you're called. Okay, great. Fantastic. But that doesn't mean anything unless you prove it and you're chosen. That's what we see here with a lot of these elders. Again, understanding the doctrine helps us unravel the history, the mystery of the history. There's a fun little rhyme for you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Isaac Morley called and chosen to receive endowment power on high. John Coral, same as Isaac Morley. Keep going. John Whitmer called and chosen endowment with power from on high. David Whitmer, again and again. A. Sidney Gilbert, um, interesting, he passed away right after this. Um, Peter Whitmer Jr., called and chosen, received endowment in Kirtland with power from on high. Simeon Carter, Newell Knight, Thomas B. Marsh, Lyman White, called and chosen, received endowment. Parley P. Pratt, Christian Whitmer, Solomon Hancock, and then th those minutes closed, signed by Frederick G. Williams Clerk. Well, this is really awesome because we see this happening like in real time as we're marching forward through history from, from the beginning, and we see this stuff going on. Um, we also see here from Oliver Cowdery's commission or charge to the 12 in minutes and blessings in February 1835. Remember, you're not to go to other nations. Remember the Terry Yee. Don't go forward yet. Till you receive your endowment, tarry at Kirtland until you are endowed with power from on high. You need a fountain of wisdom, knowledge, and intelligence such as you never had. Relative to the endowment, I make a remark or two that there be no mistake. The world cannot receive the things of God. He can, uh, he can endow you without worldly pomp or great parade. He can give you that wisdom, that intelligence, that power, which characterized, here it is again, the ancient saints and now characterized characterizes the inhabitants of the upper world, the world, heavenly world. The greatness of your commission consists in this. You are to hold the keys of this ministry. So again, we have a reference to the apostles, the apostles and the endowment. So relative to what he said here, that the Lord would, they had to receive the endowment and said, the Lord will give you wisdom, intelligence, and power. Well, let's look here at this uh, statement from Joseph Smith. This is in a discourse from Joseph in uh, June 1839, recorded by Willard Richards, when he says, there's two comforters spoken of. Now, we we read earlier about the comforter being given to Jared Carter, right? One is the Holy Ghost, or the first 
comforter is the Holy Ghost. The same, here it is, the same as given on the day of Pentecost. Why is that important to understand? Because everything that the endowment of power from on high was pointing to what happened to the apostles in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. We read that over and over again. So we have to understand that. And Joseph Smith clarifies here, and he'll continue to clarify. So there'll be no mistake. No mistake. Given on the day of Pentecost, and that all saints receive after faith, repentance, and baptism, as we read in 2 Nephi 31, this first comforter, or Holy Ghost, has no other effect than pure intelligence, which is what we're reading. The Oliver says that the, that the twelve needed, okay, give you wisdom, intelligence, and power characterized by the ancient saints of the, the early apostles. So here, has no other effect than pure intelligence. Well, interestingly, does that contradict when it said that by receiving the Holy Ghost, will we be sanctified or purified or remission of sins? And Joseph says, well, it has no other effect than pure intelligence. Well, when we understand that the intelligence is, is light and truth, thanks to section 93, that light is what purifies us and chases and pure and purges out the darkness. So understanding that doctrine helps us see that, oh, he's like, well, it's nothing, nothing but pure intelligence, just the light of God coming into you, the glory of God, same thing. The glory of God is intelligence, in other words, light and truth, same section, 93. So has no other effect than pure intelligence. It is more powerful in expanding the mind and lightening the understanding uh, storing the intellect with present knowledge of a man who is of literal seed of Abraham than one is a Gentile, though it may not have half as much visible effect upon the body. For as the Holy Ghost falls upon literal seed of Abraham, it's calm, serene, his whole body and soul are only exercised by pure spirit of intelligence, while the effect of the Holy Ghost upon the body of a Gentile is to purge out the old blood, because they have to be made a son of Abraham or daughter of Abraham and also a son or daughter of Christ. It's interesting that's you start to understand the significance of the promise to Abraham that the chosen seed would also be considered his seed, showing his alignment under Jesus Christ. Really interesting. Uh, coming back, purge out the old blood, make him actually of the seed of Abraham, that man, and also actually of the seed of Christ, that man that has none of the blood of Abraham, naturally speaking, must have a new creation by the Holy Ghost. This is why we have to receive the Holy Ghost. In such case, there may be more powerful effect upon that person's body, a Gentile's body, invisible to the eye, than upon a natural Israelite. Now, this was a huge issue in the days, for example, John the Baptist, when he says, the Lord can raise up of these stones, or these stony Gentiles, stony stones meaning like their hard hearts, he can raise up of these stones, or stony Gentiles, seed of Abraham, so it doesn't matter that you're, uh, doesn't matter that you're literal blood of Abraham, you have to also become the blood of Christ through that conversion process, this same conversion process that we're talking about right now. And that was why they got so mad at him because they said, you're not so special. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, you have to receive the gospel. You have to receive Jesus Christ and have your hearts changed. Love it, right? Isn't it so cool? Okay, let's skip then forward to 1835 in Joseph's journal. He says, I feel disposed to speak a few words more to you, my brethren, concerning the endowment of all who are prepared and are sufficiently pure or sanctified to abide the presence of the Savior will see him in the assault in the solemn assembly. Wow, imagine that. So here we have this promise or a prophecy uh, from Joseph about the solemn assembly, those who would receive the endowment of power. So if they were going to receive the endowment of power, then they would some of them who are sufficiently pure to abide the presence of the Savior. So regarding that, we need to understand this a little bit more. Uh, and we can get some of that through section 67. Check this out. Again, verily I say unto you that it's your privilege. And here it is, a promise I give unto you. Same promise. That have been ordained to this ministry, that inasmuch as you strip yourselves from jealousies, fears, humble yourselves before me through this new and everlasting covenant, promising to do my will. For you are not sufficiently humble. But if you do, the veil shall be rent, and you shall see me and know that I am. Veil being rent means in the means in this life. Because that's what it means to rend the veil. So 
not with the carnal, neither natural mind, but with the spiritual. But here it is. For no man has seen God any time in the flesh or in in mortality or mortal probation. That's what in the flesh means. Except quickened by the Spirit of God, which is the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. When a man is quickened or changed. Hmm. And so we go back to what Joseph said here. Well, if you receive the endowment of power and you are sufficiently prepared, sufficiently purified to be able to abide the presence of the Savior, then you will see him at the Psalm Assembly. Well, it's talking about the same idea here. Neither can any natural man abide the presence of God. Well, yeah, the natural man has to be put off or destroyed through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, through that sanctification process we read in Mosiah 3.19. So the natural man has to die and be, or be put off with the reception of the Holy Ghost because the natural man cannot abide the presence of God. And look what he says here. You're not able to abide the presence of God now. So <laughs> look what he's saying. You're not able to. You're still a natural man. He's talking to these elders that haven't received this endowment of power, the power of godliness, the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. They still had to continue faithful. They weren't prepared yet, but he's, but he's promising them, yeah, well, you'll get it if you keep going. So look at the end there, verse 13 at the bottom. Wherefore, continue in patience until you are perfected. Until until you are perfected. That's what we read earlier in Moroni when he's using other verbiage, Moroni 10, right at the very end of the Book of Mormon, when Moroni is trying to put an emphasis, a huge stamp on what this is all about, the whole emphasis of the gospel to become... Uh, perfect in Christ, that's what he said. Here, we'll just pull it up again. Just review real quick. Verse 33. Again, if you, by the grace of God, are perfect in Christ, by going through this process, then he's going to he's going to give in another words. He's going to define what he's talking about. And deny not his power, then this is what it means. Then you're sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ. So through the atonement, he has power to give us a remission of our sins, which is in the covenant or the promise of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that you become holy without spot. Okay? So his power is to do this. His power is to save us, and he can only save us if he makes us clean, sanctified, pure. And this is what Joseph was trying to teach them. Concerning the endowment, all who are prepared and sufficiently pure to abide the presence of the Savior will see him in the solemn assembly. Uh, here's a blessing given to Lorenzo Barnes in January 1836. So, Lorenzo, thou art a chosen vessel unto the Lord to bear the fullness of the gospel unto people and nations afar off. Be faithful, and thou shalt be endowed with power from on high, for the Spirit of the Highest shall rest upon thee. For the Spirit of the Highest shows upon me. That's how you're endowed with power from on high, having the Spirit of God come upon you through the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, receiving the Holy Ghost. That's when you receive the Holy Ghost or the gift of the Holy Ghost. And thou shalt go forth from land to land, nation to nation, kingdom to kingdom. The going forth after the endowment of power. We see it again and again. So in Joseph Smith's journal here, here's a great one. At about 3 o'clock p.m., I dismissed the school, this was the School of the Prophets and the Presidency, retired to the loft of the printing office where we attended to the ordinance of washing our bodies in pure water. We also perfumed our bodies and our heads in the name of the Lord. Let's see, footnote, footnote 271. This is right from the Joseph Smith Papers. At early candlelight, I met with the Presidency at the West School Room in the chapel to attend to the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil. Also, the Council of Zion... Kirtland and Zion meet in the two adjoining rooms who waited in prayer while we attended to the ordinance. Okay, so we see here, okay, so what is this? Anointing heads with oil, washing our bodies with pure water. First of all, quick, quick note. It is important to remember that all things are meant to point to Jesus Christ because he's the way. The way is a path, and that path is the doctrine of Christ, his doctrine or his teachings of how we get to him. Because we can only get to the Father by Him. Right? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, every single time that we have an outward ordinance, every single time that we have one of these rites or rituals or demonstrations, it has to point to Christ in some way. It has to point to His doctrine. We have to find that symbolism. 
And that symbolism can be uh, found without too much effort. Washing our bodies is all about being cleansed, right? So let's let's look at this footnote. Washing and anointing and the connected blessings and sealings of blessings were sanctifying prerequisites to endowment with power in the house of the Lord. A prerequisite. So they're trying to fulfill the commandment of the Lord to sanctify themselves, right? They had to sanctify themselves. And by sanctifying themselves, the Lord said, well, if you if you will repent, sanctify yourselves, I will make you clean. And that him making us clean is through the sanctification process through the reception of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And that helps us understand all this. So in the coming days, these ordinances were given to all the priesthood officers passing along lines of hierarchy and seniority. But here's the phrase, culminating in the solemn assembly in March 1836. The culmination of all of this. So, in other words, they were doing they were doing these things. And as you go through the Joseph Smith papers, and you you can see lots of examples of doing this a lot of times, more than once, doing the uh, washings and anointing their heads with holy oil because olive oil represents the Spirit, represents the Holy Ghost. So, being anointed is a symbol of receiving the Holy Ghost. And that's how it points to the doctrine of Christ. That's how it points to Christ, because receiving the Holy Ghost is how we become his sons and his daughters. So that's how it points to him. And that's what cleanses us, sanctifies us, a.k.a. wash is us. So washing and anointing is this idea of the purging through the baptism of fire and the reception of the Holy Ghost through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it is culminated in the solemn assembly, or that's where the endowment of power happened, and the actual baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. Okay, let's move forward then. So in Joseph Smith's journal in uh, same month, 1836, in the evening met with the presidency in the high room over the printing room and counseled on the subject of endowment and the preparation necessary for the solemn assembly, which is to be called when the house of the Lord is finished. Let's see footnote 290. Oliver Cowdery recorded that the presidency conversed upon the time of and preparation and sanctification for the endowment because the commandment is to sanctify yourselves, in other words, to repent of all your sins, to cry out my land to the Lord, promise that you'll do his will, do his will, prove with all your heart that you will obey him, and then he will sanctify you. He will make you clean. So do you have to do your effort to make yourself clean before the Lord, and then he will make you clean if you prove it. So let's see, this is a letter from the presidency of elders um, at the end of January. And these are notes from the historical introduction in Joseph Smith papers. So following his appointment, Brother Beeman worked to organize Kirtland elders and prepare them to receive the promised endowment of power. See footnote three and four. At a meeting of the Kirtland Emperor's elders on 25 January, Sidney Rigdon and Williams and Hiram Smith gave instructions respecting the elders' preparation to receive the holy anointing. So this holy anointing isn't uh, the physical anointing with oil, because this is talking about the preparation to receive the holy anointing. They were, they were just, they were constantly doing the anointing with oil, as we read back here, right here, that they were anointing their heads with oil, and they were doing it uh, multiple times to prepare their minds and look forward, because that's what that's what the physical does. That's what the outward ordinances are all about: getting our minds to shoot forward and look forward to experiencing the actual thing in real life. Because the physical ordinance isn't the actual thing. We have to have the spiritual version of it. And that's what um, that's what these things in the temple are about. That's what the outward ordinances are all about. Shoot your mind forward to the actual spiritual manifestation of it. So in this particular reference, jump back forward. So in this particular reference, the preparation to receive the holy anointing was the true anointing, the holy anointing, not just the physical anointing, the holy anointing or the Holy Ghost. Uh, so Kirtland Elders Quorum, the record of 25 January, the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil was a ritual to prepare men who had been ordained, prepare them for what? To receive the promised endowment of power at the solemn assembly. You see that? That's what it was for. 
So the actual physical anointing didn't do anything other than to try and get them prepared. The Lord was telling them what they really had to do to be sanctified. You've got to humble yourselves more before me. You've got to obey my word. You've got to strip yourselves of your pride and your jealousies and all those things that we read uh, in section 67 and everywhere else. Right? So this is, this is what Joseph is teaching this whole time, trying to get the elders to understand and get them prepared. Because... To receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, to become a child of Christ, um, is a lifelong endeavor. It it or it can be, because it can take a long time to prove yourself. Depending, it's all about the Lord's timing. It's not my timing. You know, I get baptized with water and think that bam, now I have got the Holy Ghost. Well, you're told to receive it, and you got to actually go and receive it. And so the baptism of the Holy Ghost can come much later. Depends on depends on how prepared your heart is, how prepared you are spiritually, and how much you've proven to God with all your heart that you will literally do His will. And that that's the trick. And that's what Joseph was trying to get them to understand. Now, a big part of this history that we don't have time for tonight is to understand that, uh, that even though we see that a bunch of elders did actually receive it, the church came under condemnation, which was the revelation of section 84. They came under condemnation because they weren't receiving it, and um, that con condemnation escalated to cursings from the Lord because they wouldn't receive it. In other words, they wouldn't actually, with their hearts, do everything in their power to do the Lord's will. So the church as a whole, or in general, came under came under that condemnation or curse. And uh, look, look for our episode by Mark Curtis on the condemnation of the church to get more into detail about that, but that's helpful to understand all this was going on. But regardless, the whole point that Joseph was trying to teach is that they were supposed to receive this, and and many still did. Okay, in uh, John Whitmer's history, page 83, now the time drew near when the Lord would endow his servants, and before he could do this, we must perform all the ordinances that are instituted in his house. There was one ordinance, namely the washing of feet, that we had not yet as yet observed, but did perform it according to Revelation, which ordinance belongs only to ordained members and not the whole church. Interesting. Let's see foot. <laughs> let's see footnote two forty one. So Whitmer's wording with respect to foot washing closely resembles Joseph's remarks to the Quorum of the Twelve uh, on twelfth November eighteen thirty five, recorded in Joseph's journal. While the washing of feet had in fact been introduced in eighteen thirty three as part of the school of the prophets, which we see at the end of section eighty eight. It was now elevated to a ritual of purification performed exclusively in the house of the Lord, again, to prepare the church leaders for the endowment there, the endowment of power. So a ritual of purification, uh, it, it's not a ritual that actually purifies you. It's a ritual to help you get in the mindset of, I've got to purify myself because rituals don't purify nobody. Because as Joseph said in the King Fault Discourse, the baptism by water without the getting of the Holy Ghost or the receiving of the Holy Ghost doesn't avail anything because that is the baptism of Jesus Christ where he makes us clean. He has to make us clean. So when we when we read this, we have to understand that, that the ritual is just to point our minds. It's to prepare us. That's what the ritual is for. Because um, you can be endowed with knowledge, but this is endowment of power. Okay, we want to be endowed with power from on high, not just knowledge. Because we can be given the knowledge of the gospel and with our lips honor God, but we got to prove it. So moving on. So in the minutes of the high council, um, this is after the dedication. I then observed to the quorums that I had now completed their organization of the church. We'd passed through all the necessary ceremonies that I had given them all the instruction they needed and that they now were at liberty after obtaining their licenses to go forth and build up the kingdom of God. Well, they couldn't go forth unless they'd have the, the endowment of power. So, and some of them did, or a lot of them did, through through the through the solemn assembly. And that it was expedient for me and the presidency to retire, having spent the night previous in waiting upon the Lord in His temple, waiting, tarrying for what for His promise, and having to attend another dedication on the morrow, or conclude the one commenced on the last Sabbath for the benefit of those my brethren uh, and sisters who couldn't get to the house of the Lord. Okay, let's uh, skip ahead to the next one. Uh, continuing, the brethren continued exhorting, prophesying, and speaking in tongues until five in the morning. And then look at this. The Savior made his appearance to some, while angels ministered unto others. Now, this ministering of angels is significant. The ministering of angels happens when the Aaronic priesthood is sealed upon a man. 
but it also happens at the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. Let's so we're going to interrupt this slide briefly to see an example of that shortly after Jesus comes to the Americas. He ordains and sets apart the 12 disciples. He gives them power to give the Holy Ghost. So the end, uh, let's pull this up here. The end of chapter 18, we see this here. I go to the Father because it's expedient that I go for your sakes, because he has to testify to our Father that you are clean from the blood and sins of this generation. We read that earlier in the Revelations. And it came to pass that when he said these things, he touched with his hand, laid his hands on the disciples whom he had chosen one by one until he touched them all. And the multitude didn't hear what he said, but the disciples bore record that he gave them power to give the Holy Ghost, the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And I will show unto the... I will show unto you hereafter that this record is true. Well, let's just skip to the next chapter and see it happen. Because Nephi uh, receives this baptism by the higher authority that they had just received. They desired that the Holy Ghost be given unto them. So Nephi goes down, gets baptized, and then he baptized the others that he had cho- that Jesus had chosen. So look at this. And it came to pass that when they were all baptized and come out of the water, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. There it is, baptism and fire in the Holy Ghost. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Well, let's keep going. Verse 14. They were encircled about as if it were by fire. Pillars of fire or cloven tongues of fire coming down from heaven, which we're going to see. And it came down from heaven. The fire came down from heaven. Pillars of fire from heaven. And the multitude did witness it and bore record. And here it is. And angels came down and ministered unto them, because that is a part of the experience of the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And while the angels were ministering unto them, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. And we see him later that uh, that he walks away and he he begins to pray. And he says, Father, I thank that you have given the Holy Ghost unto these I have chosen. So that's the experience where we receive the Holy Ghost, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. So come back here to this instruction from or uh, these notes from Joseph. The Savior made his appearance to some because they were prepared enough. While angels ministered unto others, those who received the endowment of power. And it was a Pentecost and endowment or endowment indeed. There it is. It was a Pentecost, just like the day, the day of Pentecost with the, with the apostles. Long to be remembered, for the sound shall go forth from this place into all the world, and the occurrences of this day shall be handed down upon the pages of sacred history to all generations as the day of Pentecost. So shall this day be numbered and celebrated as a year of jubilee and time of rejoicing, to the saints of the Most High God. So, we're now going to go to this letter that Joseph wrote where he's going to go a little bit more into the day of Pentecost, and then we're going to uh, read some of these uh, verses. In fact, let's read these. Let's read the account really quick. Let's jump. So, it's Acts chapter 2, right at the very beginning of the chapter. It's really brief, um, but it still gives us these pieces to help us understand the pouring out of the Holy Ghost upon the apostles. So the Lord tells them to tarry at Jerusalem and tell the endowment of power. Well, so here we go. Uh, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And look at this. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, which is what we uh, read Joseph put into the dedicatory prayer at Kirtland. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Filled them with what? What did it fill the house with? With light, with glory, with the power of the Holy Ghost. Because that's what they were about to receive. And here, verse 3. And there appeared unto them, or came unto them, cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Cloven tongues like as of fire. We don't... Okay, so, so the Bible, the King James Version, has... Uh, These wordings that are less common. Cloven meaning separated or distinct. Tongues meaning extensions or pillars. Distinct or separate or divided. Cloven tongues or extensions or pillars of fire or like as of fire. Because it's not literal fire, but it's like as of fire. And it sat or came or fell. Sat meaning comes from above and comes down on top of them. Sat upon each of them. 
Now look at this. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. So let's look at this letter. Joseph's going to talk about this. He's talking, this is a letter to Isaac Galand in 1839. So later in that chapter, so all, all these disciples, the apostles and other disciples received the Holy Ghost here. And then other people witnessed it. And they're like, wow, what shall we do? What shall we do? So Joseph says, and again, we read in second chapter 38 verse, then Peter said unto them, well, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. or Ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Just like we did just now. And then Joseph continues. Here you see the doctrine of repentance and baptism for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost connected by the promise inseparably. By the promise inseparably. What promise? The promise that Jesus said in, that we read in Luke. The promise of the Father that they would be endowed with power from on high. Endowed with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then Joseph continues. Now I want you to consider the high standing of Peter. He was now being endowed with power from on high. Look, there it is. He was now, in this moment, being endowed with power from on high by receiving the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And he held the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which he quotes, remembering from Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus says to him, I'll give you unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And Joseph quotes this because of this promise that Peter just gave them, as Joseph continues. This was the character or the personage, sir, that made the glorious promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter made this promise to these saints or to these would-be disciples who are asking what they should do because they're pricked in their hearts, having felt the power of the Holy Ghost. So this promise predicated upon the baptism for the remission of sins. That glorious promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the promise of the Father. And Peter, he did not say that it was a, it was confined to that generation alone, but see further in the next verse, for the promise is unto you and your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Then, good sir, if the callings of God extend unto us, we come within the purview of Peter's promise to be able to receive the Holy Ghost, or to be able to receive the endowment of power. He was in the process of now being endowed with power from on high. So continuing in, in his uh, letter, he talks about, okay, so now concerning the doctrine of laying out of hands for the giving of the Holy Ghost. Next chapter 8, let me read that. So all of this endowment of power about the reception of the Holy Ghost, receiving the Holy Ghost through the laying out of hands. So he continues about that. Now, right here, we see in Joseph's discourse in uh, June 1843, we just have some notes. These are just notes from the discourse from Wilford Woodruff. Gathered you for baptism for the dead, for washing, for anointings, etc., said Jesus to the Jews. At one time, God obtained a house where Peter was in doubt, etc., on the day of Pentecost. So again, just, just reiterating and establishing, without a doubt, what this endowment is meant to be. What it's supposed to be. So, as we're trying to put these pieces together, and say, okay, so we have all these rituals, washings and anointings, washings representing being cleansed, which is the remission of sins, becoming blameless, holy, without spot, becoming a saint. Having the fire from heaven, that fire that we read about, Acts 2, and 35, 19, and the, even as the Lamanites as promised in 35, 9, even as the Lamanites, well, that was in Helaman chapter 5. So let's remember that. I will baptize you with fire and the Holy Ghost, even as the Lamanites, because of their faith in me at the time of their conversion. Well, these Lamanites here in chapter 5, if we scroll down and see those last uh, 15 verses of the chapter, so the Lord commands them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and they were like afraid of being destroyed because they were being threatened with destruction. And we scroll down, Aminadab tells them, that we have to repent and cry into the voice until you have faith in Christ and the cloud of darkness would be lifted from us. So they begin to cry and they cried until the cloud of darkness was dispersed. And look at this. And they cast their eyes round about and the cloud of darkness was dispersed. And they saw that they were encircled about every soul by a pillar of fire or by cloven tongues as if 
of fire. And Nephi and Lehi were in the midst of them, and they were encircled about. And they were as if in the midst of a flaming fire. As if fire. Again, see? And it didn't harm them. Now did it take hold of the walls of the prison? Because it's not actual fire, but it's the light and glory of God. They were filled with that joy, which is unspeakable and full of glory, which we read about that happened to the people under King Benjamin in Mosiah chapter 4, being filled with that same joy. Behold, the Holy Spirit of God did come down from heaven and enter into their hearts, and they were filled as if with fire. And they could speak forth marvelous words that speaking the gift of uh, the, the tongue of angels. So then a voice came, peace unto you, because your faith in my well-beloved. And then look at this. When they heard this, they cast their eyes up as if to behold whence the voice came. And behold, they saw the heavens open and angels came down and ministered unto them. So there it is again, the ministering of angels at this event of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And about 300 souls saw and heard these things and they were bidden or commanded to go forth and marvel not or not doubt. Right? Not be like, you know, well, I don't know about this. And like, no, they were, then they went forth faithfully and testified about all the things, testified about all the things that they had heard, the voice of God, and seen the pillars of fire, the angels, and testifying of their joy and their remission of sins. And they were able to convince many that they yelled up the Nephites line of their position. They convinced thousands of brethren of the Lamanites. So when we go through these rituals, these ordinances, even the baptism of water, that has to point our minds to the experience of being converted to God, being converted to Christ. And that's that's becoming his sons and his daughters. So read again in 3 Nephi 9, And as many as have received me, and we do that by receiving his gospel, to them I have given to become the sons of God, the sons or daughters of Christ. And even so I will, to as many as believe on my name. And that's the promise that Joseph was talking about. To everybody. As many as believe on my name. For behold, by me redemption cometh. And to me is the law of, law of Moses is fulfilled. So, verse 20. And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Even as Lamanites, because of their faith in me at the time of their conversion, were baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost. And they knew it not. They didn't know it because they didn't know that's what it was. They just knew that they had this awesome experience. They didn't know that was baptism of the Holy Ghost. They had to be taught by Nephi and Lehi. So, everything has to point to the gospel. Everything has to point to the doctrine of Christ, which is how we get back to him. How we become his sons and his daughters. How we become clean, spotless, holy. All this stuff doesn't mean anything unless we do it. We have to do God's will. We have to humble ourselves before him, prostrate ourselves to the earth, cry out unto him mightily, Beg for forgiveness, beg to help us understand his will and to do it, to have the power to carry it out. Because that's the hard part. We can tell God that we love him, we believe in him, but then he asks us to do the hard thing that we don't want to do. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We will have a discussion over on Zoom. Welcome you to join us, doctrineofchrist.com forward slash join. And we will have a discussion, Q&A. Great time to participate in that, doctrineofchrist.com forward slash join and click on the Tuesday night. And we look forward to uh, part two of the LDS Endowment is taught by Joseph Smith, which will be uh, oh, probably maybe a month or two from now. But we do our regular Tuesday night broadcasts always here on the Doctrine of Christ YouTube channel. So uh, feel free to come join us over there and we'll see you soon.